It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this seminar, which physically takes place here in the Directorate of Health in Oslo, Norway. Um, and to all of you who follow the seminar online as well. My name is Björn Gullvåg and I am Director General of Health here in Norway and uh, Chief Medical Officer. The Directorate is subordinated to the Ministry of Health Care uh, and um, uh, services with three main roles. We are a professional agency uh, with, uh, where we work on uh, uh, strategies, policies, uh, guidelines. We're also an executor, implementer of health uh, and care policy and we are an administrator in healthcare financing and also interpreter of legislation in Norway. Health legislation, that is. Thank you to the EuroHealthNet for asking the directorate to host the annual meeting, which takes place uh, over these two days. Of course, the topics that you have raised for this meeting uh, are very relevant both in Norway and in a lot of other countries. Both non-communicable diseases and climate and health are topics in the new Norwegian white paper on public health. In this country, we have a system for reviewing the public health policy every four years in form of a white paper. The latest white paper pays att special attention to reducing social inequalities in health. Of relevance is also that our Public Health Act has been in place for 10 years now. The purpose of this act is to contribute to societal development that promotes public health and reduces social inequalities in health. Non-communicable diseases is one of the focus areas in the new white paper on public health. And Norway has joined the uh, WHO goal of reducing the number of people who die early from NCDs by a third uh, before 2030, based on figures from 2015. The government has announced a comprehensive NCD strategy in the years to come. The development in Norway appears to be positive for several of the goals WHO has set out to combat the NCDs. For two goals, however, we have not been able to reverse the trend. This applies to physical inactivity and the goal of halting the increase in obesity and diabetes. Broad universal and structural measures such as financial instruments and regulations have proven to be well suited to reduce NCDs together with community oriented measures and adapted information. This is central in the Norwegian public health policy. The directorate is increasingly engaging in international cooperation and aspire together with the Norwegian Public Health Institute uh, to take the lead on the new joint action on cancer and NCD prevention, one of the largest initiatives on NCD prevention on the European level. It will be challenging, but also very exciting. It's an exciting task for Norway, for the Directorate and for the National Institute of Public Health. Climate change will have a ma major impact on public health work in the future. The connection between climate and health is becoming increasingly clear and the climate has become an integrated part of our public health policy, both in terms of measures to help reduce emissions to, or of greenhouse gases, uh, climate change adaption and the transition to a climate resilient society. As stated in the white paper on public health, the government will, among other things, promote active transport and sustainable diet in line with the national dietary advice. Underway is furthermore a roadmap for the health sector to secure low emissions of greenhouse gases in collaboration with municipalities, health services and relevant actors by the end of this year. I wish you all an inspiring seminar, an interesting seminar, and now I would like to give the floor to the president uh, for EuroHealthNet, Professor Martin Dietrich. The floor is yours.
Yes, thank you, um, Dr. Dildborg, at the Norwegian Directorate of Health, dear Caroline from your house, and dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. On behalf of the EuroHealthNet Executive Board, I would like to warmly welcome everyone at our annual seminar titled Making Progress on Health Equity, Setting Targets and Developing Policies to Prevent Chronic Diseases and Mitigate Climate Change. It's great to see so many of you here in the room and I also want to welcome all of our participants online, over 470 people registered for our seminar online. I would like to thank our wonderful host, the Norwegian Directorate of Health, Dr. Guldvog and his colleagues to host us here at their premises in beautiful Oslo. Your HealthNet brings together over 60 public health and health promotion organizations in Europe. Our core members are national institutes of public health, regional health authorities, but also some ministries of health. We are also delighted to increasingly see research organizations like universities and think tanks joining us because we find it highly important to work on the evidence base for health interventions and to develop knowledge and evidence not only on what health problems we have, but also on the solutions, on the evidence, on what works. Partnerships such as EuroHealthNet are key as we are facing huge societal challenges. We can only tackle them effectively if we work together and exchange knowledge and strategies. In this seminar, we are going to zoom into two of these challenges. First, increasing burden of NCDs, and second, climate change. We are particularly discussing how we can use target setting in ways that public health authorities can take actions in their contexts. What targets do your organizations have? What targets does your region or country have in these areas? How are they being monitored? Are they actionable? Are people aware of them? Can data gathered by monitoring systems be used for learning? And are they sensitive enough to measure the effects of interventions? There are also examples of existing frameworks for action, such as the European Pillar of Social Rights, presenting 20 principles and three headline targets that heads of EU states signed up to such as to reduce at last 15 million in the number of people at risk of poverty or social exclusion by 2030. This is an important target reflecting the underlying social determinants of health and for reducing health inequalities. We should make more use of the European pillar of social rights in our public health and health promotion community. The 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development is another existing framework of goals and targets that countries politically endorsed. In September 2023, the United Nations will launch its second review on Global Sustainability Development Report as the world approaches the halfway point. We already know that the NCD target will not be met. This is alarming as we also know that NCDs are the leading causes of ill health worldwide and were responsible for 7 out of 10 premature deaths in 2019. And this gave reason for the target to reduce the probability of dying prematurely from NCDs. In the EU, the probability of dying between the ages of 30 and 70 years from NCDs like cardiovascular diseases, cancer, diabetes, or chronic respiratory diseases decreased from 15.8 in 2010 to 13.5 in 2019. This represents an average reduction of 1.9%. But the actual pace of progress has steadily declined in recent years. Based on our estimates, premature mortality due to the NCDs will only have been reduced by 23% by the year 2030, compared to 2050. This is 10% less than the targeted 33%, meaning that we in Europe are not on track. And we are also not on track regarding climate crisis either. And this means that we have not only to be more serious about mitigating climate change and giving our very best to stop a further acceleration of climate change. More healthy behaviors like plant-based diet or more physical activity in everyday life and more mental and psychological resilience 
would contribute to it. It now also means the need for adaptation to climate change, the precautionary handling of unavoidable consequences of climate change, and extreme weather events, minimizing risks, avoiding damage, and adapting to the changes to be expected. We need to ensure that these changes do not become another factor that makes health equity and inequality even worse. Discussions on targets and priority settings processes will take the forefront in the next years and the near future due to the European elections. Around this time in June next year, we will see the elections of the European Parliament and the subsequent legislative renewal with the new European Commission. Health may not be as central to political discussions as it was during the COVID pandemic and unfortunately seems to be not as central as we feel it needs to be. We therefore must prepare ourselves, reflect on our targets and priorities to move forward and make progress and to advocate for them. For our institutions and agencies in which we work, it is also important to reflect and consider our ambitions in NCDs prevention and climate change mitigation and adaption. This is why we organized this seminar. We invite a distinguished expert to give their views on the ways forward in these two important areas of work, and I look forward to hearing from them. I wish you all an inspiring seminar. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks a lot to both welcoming speakers. And here we are, the moderators of today's seminar. Uh, here is me, Moita Gabrielcic from National Institute of Public Health. And hello, my name is Sumina Azam. Yes, I will be moderating on NCD part and Sumina. Yep, I will be joining you later for the climate change section. So thank you. <laughs> OK, thank you, Sumina. And uh, what I can say that uh, these seminars are close to my heart, one of the best things happening in EuroHealthNet uh, since I know for the partnership. And this one has the same aim, so that we explore what is in the areas we are going to discuss today and use it best, the outcomes, the learnings, uh, what is coming from the discussions uh, to what we are going to do in the next year time till the next General Assembly. So thanks that we have picked uh, again so uh, relevant topics. And speaking about the topics, I think the implementation is the key word. And implementation always being, it seems so challenging. We know a lot if I use the cracks cycle on accountability cycle, taking, sharing, it means we know, know quite a lot about the numbers where we are. We are able to speak about what is going on, but holding and responding to the account, the third and the fourth point in the cycle, this seems to be so challenging that even in the literature, you can see the special chapter on taking, a special one on sharing the account, but holding and responding are together because there is knowledge lacking in this field. So I think that's really something what is in front of us in this seminar, and I'm looking very much forward to the nice three speakers which we have uh, in the first part of the program. We will start with the Professor Knutinge Klepp, and then uh, we will see how Professor uh, Jessica Allens is um, succeeding to come from the airport. Uh, that's why we will switch a bit the agenda with uh, Dr. Gauden Galea and Dr. Kira Fortuna first, and then we will see if we, uh, Dr. Allen will be able to reach us before the break or she's joining only after, and we will, have the, we will be finishing this first part uh, and moving her then in the second one. Uh, but let's talk about the non-communicable diseases, the first part of our seminar first. And that is, we all know that in spite of all what has been done, and we have decreasing numbers in NCD, specifically in some, but not in all countries, in some of them, is still Europe with one of the highest burdens in around, uh, around the world, in the plan, on the planet. And that's uh, everything really substantially impacting the way of our lives. Uh, the latest the um, figures calculated by WHO are really frightening for o obesity. If we do not do anything really substantial, we will have the increases in obesity in boys, something about 60, and for girls almost 75%. It's really huge by 
33. <laughs> we have to act. And how to act, what to do? Uh, should we uh, discuss and revise the NCD targets? Uh, how could we capitalize best on what we have uh, achieved till now? So how to reflect on these challenges, challenges while we are um, advising to the policymakers and while policymakers are making their decisions and specifically the officials at different sectors sitting and somewhere in between trying to find the best solutions what to do. And here we are with the first speaker. I'm kindly asking Professor Knut Inge Klipp here from Norway, Norwegian uh, Institute of Public Health. He's the executive director. Uh, to speak about that, I know uh, Knut Inge that you will be coordinating the new Joint Action Prevent NCD, which is really the opportunity for the European space, and that you will discuss what the structure agency dilemma is here behind, what can we do individually in the structure, in the system. So please, Knut Inge, the word is yours. Thank you very much, Marcia. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I used to be the director of public health here and the directorate of health at the time when we applied to become a member of EuroHealthNet, uh, but I think it's the first time I'm actually attending a meeting, so I'm very pleased uh, to be here. Let's see, I have some slides. Uh, will they come? There they are. Um, so, uh, reducing the burden of NCD. Um, is the main goal, and I have the uh, subtitle here, Ambitious Intention to Reduce Health Inequalities Across Europe, which I think fits well with the theme of this meeting, uh, making progress on health uh, equity. Uh, having done a lot of research on behavior and what uh, forms people's behavior, we know that intention to act and to change is a key uh, factor. But intention in itself is not enough. So how do, can we really act and uh, be successful with the intention to re reduce social inequality in this area is the question. And I wanted to uh, briefly pick up on some of the aspects that um, Björn Gullvog said in his introductory remark regarding how we have organized this field in uh, Norway and particular point to our Public Health Act uh, of 2012 and also the white papers to the Parliament that he uh, mentioned. I think there are two at least key aspects here that are really important and the one is that we have introduced a systematic approach to public health uh, efforts where uh, we, based on data that are available, set goals and then try to define what are the uh, key uh, actions that should be implemented and then evaluate. And this circle followed the election circle of uh, municipality boards in the Norwegian municipalities. So every fourth year when we have the election, the government in advance of that gives out a white paper where they give their analysis and also direction for public health work and then this is taken into the account of the regular planning work that they do in the municipalities. What has been uh, very positive is that this system has been established then and is respected by all uh, political parties so it survives from one government uh, to the other and also we see that when these white papers are um, uh, presented to the parliament it is a fantastic opportunity for both non-governmental organizations, the professional community, and the political establishment, both at the national level and at the local level, to really um, rally against and come forward with their priorities. The last uh, white paper was presented just before Easter and will be debated in the parliament later this month. But even last week, we had a decision in the parliament saying that um, they now want to ban marketing of um, advertisement of unhealthy food and drinks to children under the age of 18. And uh, that is a big change in, uh, compared to what uh, legislation we have in place now, where it is uh, more voluntary action and where it is uh, children under the age of 12 years that is being protected. Now it is raised to 18 years. 
And I think um, while this was not a proposal in the white paper, the fact that we had these discussions re at a regular basis really helped bring up um, proposals like this one. I also pointed to the, um, well, we also need the data, and um, it's already uh, pres uh, made the point that we, we know the figures. Um, and in Norway, we've been able to monitor the development in a non governmental, uh, in, sorry, in um, NCD mortality, and this is for the young age group under the age of 70, uh, going back to 2005. And as you can see, there has been quite a strong decline over time. But when we look then to see how does this um, compare with the different educational groups, and here you have those who have the red line, the compulsory um, uh, uh, education, upper secondary, and then the lowest is the college or, or university education. You see that there is the very clear um, difference gradient that we know from so many uh, countries and uh, outcomes. And even though there is a decline in all groups, the difference between the groups seems to persist uh, over time. And we have similar data on the different uh, um, disease outcomes. We also have it on risk factors, and we see that it is a very consistent pattern. And we also know that it is a pattern that appears at a very young age. So even at school-aged children, we see these kind of differences based on parental education or, or job uh, uh, categories. So how then can we be successful in, in narrowing this uh, gap? Uh, and I think a key thing there is to really focus both on the society and the individual uh, level factors. And um, this uh, figure tried to illustrate that if you really want to have an impact at a population level, you have to look at the more distal factors, the structural factors, uh, policy changes that affect many people. And at an individual level, the impact of those changes could be quite small, but when you go at the population level, they are large and important. But when we look at the evidence-based in public health, we see that the large body of research is to the right of the picture. We really have a lot of information about individual level intervention, often performed in uh, randomized controlled trials that are given a high uh, value seen as very um, uh, giving strong evidence. While we have fewer studies and they're often graded uh, poorer when we look at population level uh, uh, studies. So how can we contribute to get more evidence in the left end, end of this um, uh, picture is really the question. And one reason for that is also because we know that if we only focus on the individual level uh, intervention, they often require quite a bit of uh, interest uh, and resources from the individual so that it, uh, first of all, uh, aspire or include those that have uh, an interest in health and are uh, uh, also have the resources to change. And for that reason, we see that these uh, measures often contribute to increasing social inequality rather than to reduce it. So then we are all very happy when the uh, European Commission um, invited calls to the joint action on NCD prevention, action on health determinants. And when I accepted uh, to give this talk uh, today, we thought that we would have received feedback uh, from the Commission on our proposal and that we knew quite a bit of what uh, they wanted us to uh, proceed with. Unfortunately, we have not heard uh, yet uh, from them, so um, that uh, is still uh, to come. But when we look at the objectives they have said, it is to reduce the burden of NCD and the common risk factors. And they very clearly said this should be addressing both personal or individual level factors and also looking at societal factors. And they're really pointing to the fact that there are a lot of fragmentation in this field in Europe, so they want a more uh, coherent, consistent or holistic, uh, as they say, um, approach to NCD uh, prevention, promoting engagement and increasing impact across uh, countries. 
So in order to take on that large challenge, uh, we have um, put together a proposal that was submitted in mid-February, and as I said, we hope to have feedback uh, quite soon, where we really try to uh, focus across the uh, spectrum of different um, uh, measures. Um, we have one work package focusing on regulation and taxation, really looking at structural measures, see what is the knowledge base, how can we uh, further improve it, and how can we make sure to implement uh, uh, policies that have proven to work. We focus a lot on the immediate environment, municipality, and uh, different arenas such as uh, school, healthcare services, and also work sites and the digital environment. And we do also uh, look to see what are the uh, uh, best interventions that can help um, uh, individuals to take action, identify individuals uh, at risk, and uh, to uh, increase um, their health literacy across the spectre of uh, the population. So, in conclusion, the uh, objective of this uh, joint uh, action is to scale up primary NCD prevention measures that have proven to work. We want to focus on the societal level drivers and population impact in addition to the individual level intervention. We acknowledge the need for a systems approach in this area because we know that complex problems cannot be solved by simple measures and we employ, employ an equity lens to all planned uh, measures. As you saw from the previous slide, we do have a special work package on uh, reducing social inequality that cuts across the spectrum of the measures. And we also want to secure broad user involvement uh, from different uh, groups. It is a large uh, joint action, both in terms of the funding that's set aside from the uh, Commission in terms of the number of countries in Europe that are participating, it is uh, 25 countries that are part of this uh, joint action. And also in terms of um, the um, uh, number of partners, there's more than 100 partners across Europe that is uh, participating. And uh, we have 10 work packages, um, we have more than 50 tasks and more than 200 pilots and actions that has been uh, planned for. So, um, to work on something um, this size, we are very much dependent on the line out and collaborate with existing other pan-European organizations. So, for that reason, we're extremely happy to be able to work with the EuroHealthNet, WHO and others. And I'm really looking forward to collaborate on this in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Knutinge. It seems rather simple if you look at this picture and it's quite obvious to all of us where to go and what, so thanks for being so clear. Uh, but the implementation seems to be the challenge again and I, I really hope that in the next four years the member states and the competent authorities, affiliated authorities will be able to deliver. Uh, but uh, yeah, let's discuss it, how to do it best. Thanks for raising a lot of challenges. Um, one, one side is European Union we are discussing now, but uh, we really can all learn a lot from what we can do jointly also in, within the context of WHO. Uh, so first of all, we will listen to, uh, I think, the video of uh, Dr. Gauden Galea. He was not able to join us here. And then we have here also Dr. Kira Fortune, who will add to, to this video. So first, I would kindly like to ask the technicians to run the video for us. Ladies and gentlemen, setting targets has been essential to advancing the NCD movement. The global NCD strategy was first adopted by the World Health Assembly in 2000, yet the Millennium Development Goals adopted in that same year did not reflect that strategy. No NCD targets were included in the MDGs. In the decade that followed, while we saw advances in specific areas of NCDs, 
the WHO FCTC, the Global Strategy on Diet and Physical Activity, the Global Action Plan on the Harmful Use of Alcohol, we did not see the movement attract high-level political attention. It was not until a concerted movement to solidify the arguments on the mutual links between NCDs, poverty, inequity and the disproportionate burden of NCDs on low and middle income countries that the first UN high-level meeting on NCDs was organized in 2011. The series of UN high-level meetings that followed created a momentum for the movement on NCDs. They resulted in NCDs being made first-class members in the global development discussion with targets that ranged from the reduction of premature mortality to the reduction of alcohol consumption. Specific discussions on fundings were held and the European region itself saw a growth in the programs on NCD prevention and control with an increase in human and financial resources in both WHO and member states. As the UN high-level meeting of 2025 approaches and beyond it the 2030 deadlines of the SDGs there is a new political urgency, the war in Ukraine, earthquakes in Turkey and northern Syria, the hollowing out of health systems with the loss of health workforce and the erosion of trust in institutions, in experts and in science. Politicians and policymakers have a lot on their plate. Where does NCD fit in? Second, as time for action grows shorter, the relative importance of different interventions rebalances itself. The importance of direct action on averting deaths, such as reducing deaths from stroke in the East and deaths from cancer in the West of Europe, grow in importance. The actions we recommend to governments must not only be best buys, but they must be quick buys producing benefits in the short term. For example, Regional specialist stroke centers may save more lives in the short term than larger scale, more long term investments in other levels of care. The urgency of enforcing controls on alcohol and tobacco use, on salt for example, which have stalled in many countries, all grow in urgency. We need to consider whether the resources we invest in interventions with lower immediate return are worth the time and money we put into them. Third, inequity and action on the social com and commercial determinants of NCDs, as in 2011, must again be drivers in our efforts to shine a spotlight on this leading killer of Europeans. Let us just consider cancer. There are huge gradients in cancer incidence and mortality between the East and West of Europe. There are major socio-economic inequalities in EU countries in cancer mortality by level of education. In Central Asia, girls with childhood cancer are left undiagnosed and therefore untreated four times more frequently than boys. Access to pain relief in cancer is inadequate in the opiophobic countries that make up half of Europe. Here is our challenge. In the next five years, we must see a remobilization of the NCD movement around these three points. We must regain political priority for NCDs in the time of perma crisis. We must rebalance our priorities on the twin dimensions of effectiveness but also urgency. We must innovate with more fundamental action on the social, environmental and commercial determinants of NCDs. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And it's great to see that uh, Dr. Galea is uh, appointed a special advisor on NCDs at the WHO Regional Office for Europe. I know that a lot of uh, colleagues from WHO are also attending uh, online. So thanks to all of them together and uh, for this very, really inspiring short video. Um, so not going because it's nothing to, to, to uh, just repeat, maybe ask Kira directly for her comments on that, what Gauden has just said from the implementation point of view and health promotion, where we can add. Please, Kira, the word is yours.
thank you very much and thank you for that very nice introduction and colleagues it's lovely to see you in this uh, glorious sunny afternoon in Oslo and uh, I for one feel very privileged to be here I have been following the work uh, here in Norway for years so I'm also very excited to have uh, just seen this uh, latest uh, developments as well. Um, so I have the grand task of following the, the grand uh, Gauden Galea and what I'm going to do is that I'm going to speak a little bit to how we implement this agenda and how we address those targets um, and also speak to some of those innovative practices that Dr. Galea, he spoke to just now. So I would like to start off by taking you back to 2015. As you know, 2015 was a historic year. It was historic in the sense that the global community concluded the Millennium Development Goals and also adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. I think it's fair to say that uh, there was much to celebrate. We saw an increase in life expectancy, a decrease in extreme poverty and a decrease in under five mortality. But at the same time, there was also recognition that not everybody had benefited equally from this progress. So you may have heard these numbers before, but I think it's always a good reminder um, to just remind ourselves that if you are a baby girl born today in Japan, you are likely to live 32 years longer than a baby girl born in Mozambique. So place matters. And that's why I've also put this metro map here. Some of you who have seen us speak before know that this is a metro map that we are very fond of. I used to live in Washington DC and I used to commute on this uh, red line. And you will see that um, just within 17 metro stops spanning over 30 miles, there is an estimated difference of nine years in terms of life expectancy. So again, it's just to remind ourselves that when we speak about inequalities, it's important that we don't just speak about inequalities between countries, but also within countries. And I think that's a very important part of the conversation today, because I will also speak, be speaking about uh, the powerful role of political leaders at the local level. So if we zoom in a little bit closer to the European uh, region, I want to take you from the global now to a sort of uh, into, uh, into this very region. So we know that uh, two thirds of the populations in this region live in urban environments. Uh, physical activity is uh, responsible for approximately one million deaths uh, every year in this region. And air pollution is uh, also a huge challenge. Approximately 1.4 million Europeans uh, die prematurely each year uh, due to polluted environments. So what we have done at the WHO to address those challenges is that we've set ourselves some very ambitious targets. Some of you may have heard about the DPW 13, which is the WHO uh, five-year working plan, where we have set ourselves uh, the, what we refer to as the triple billion targets. And that is that uh, we have set out to ensure that one billion more people benefit from universal health coverage, uh, that one million more people are better protected from health emergencies and that one million more people are enjoying better health and well-being. And this is important because uh, what, and again, I want to really speak to sort of the uh, importance of local policymakers, because if you take a look uh, in this work plan, you will also see that mayors and local politicians are considered as essential stakeholders in terms of implementing uh, the, the one billion target on in, for people to enjoy better health and well-being. And this is also very much reflected in the European work plan, which is that of our what we often consider as our implementation plan of, uh, of this grand triple billion uh, target. We are committed to ensuring that we leave no one behind, recognizing the importance of really implementing a whole of government approach. That is to say, recognizing that a lot of these complex challenges can not be solved by one sector alone, but again, as we've heard early, really requires uh, the different sectors to come together and address these, what we often refer to as complex and wicked challenges. 
Now, since the GPW and EPW, I know there's a lot of acronyms here, were adopted, uh, the world has changed significantly. Uh, we have lived through uh, a pandemic. We are seeing um, uh, a, a lot of challenges in the regions, both in terms of our health systems, lack of trust, as you heard as well from Dr. Galea, in terms of in governments, as well as uh, the war that's happening. And um, as a result, in 2021, during the 10th Global uh, Conference on Health Promotion, uh, a number of participants from across the world came together adopting the Geneva Charter of Wellbeing. And this is really recognizing that we cannot continue to do business as usual. This charter really built on the Ottawa Charter and it was, uh, it was intended to really ensure that we put people at the very center of all of our policies. So here you'll see underneath, you'll see the different uh, components of the charter. I think what's important to say here is um, that this is, it's not new, it's uh, something that we are building on, but we also have a number of, again, uh, cities that have been implementing this at a rapid speed. And that's what I want to talk to you, uh, that's what I want to address right now. So I have the privilege of coordinating the Healthy Cities Network. The Healthy Cities Network uh, was established 35 years ago. It was established as a way to really putting the Ottawa Charter out in the streets of the people, recognizing that cities play a powerful role in terms of addressing challenges such as NCDs uh, by recognizing that we need to transform those environments that we live in, where we love, where we play, where we work, and also understanding that cities have a powerful role in terms of working closely with the communities, but they are often also much more agile players than national bodies, so that they have this ability to really implement and work across sectors in and implementing very innovative practices. Now, initially, when it, this uh, network was established 11 years ago, it, uh, sorry, 35 years ago, it was uh, 11 cities that came together. It has since grown, so it's a very powerful movement. Uh, we work with more than 1,400 cities uh, across 20 countries in the region. And again, what's important is that we really work aligning ourselves with the SDGs. So we work in five-year program phases, and right now we're in phase seven, and we work in line with what we refer to as the six Ps. So we have added another P from the Sustainable Development Goals. So it's about people, it's about participation, it's about peace. And we have also added the P for place, recognizing the importance of also transforming places uh, to address uh, issues such as uh, non-communicable diseases. Now, what's important about this network, of course, is that we are really uh, connecting global and local agendas. I spoke about the Geneva Charter for Wellbeing. I would argue that that charter is already being implemented at city level by local policy makers. Um, we, you, you heard Galau, um, um, Dr. Galea talk about the importance of innovation. I think what we have seen during COVID-19 is the importance of cities in terms of implementing very innovative approaches, whether it's at school, at the community center, whether it's setting up the 15 minutes initiative so that they're reaching uh, the whole of the community, but also knowing their community, knowing where those that are most vulnerable and how best to reach those. Cities have also been leading by example. So we often talk about the need to move away from these siloed approaches. Cities for years have been had, had that ability to really work across uh, sectors and have really shown the impact of that. And then, of course, also building local partnership and collaborative leadership is a significant uh, sort of essential part of this movement. And just to say that I talked about the, uh, the, the Geneva Charter for Wellbeing, we are currently unpacking that. And again, just to show what a rapid speed that cities they can move at is that we are currently uh, piloting, initiating a piloting 
on the well-being in in sorry on on the health and the well-being economy again reflecting the need to really unpack this agenda and we are currently working with 10 cities that are coming together to really pilot this and the idea is to really uh, again we are at the very early phase of this and the idea is that we are going to then scale that up so that we can learn from those lessons learned and again inform uh, global policy making with those lessons learned so on a final uh, note, colleagues, what I wanted to share with you, uh, really from uh, following up on Galea, uh, Gaon Galea's um, uh, presentation, is that the Healthy Cities Network is an example of one of those innovative mechanisms where you can, again, they're implementing the SDGs, the GPW, the Geneva Charter of Wellbeing, and again, it's a very powerful vehicle to again making sure that uh, we leave no one behind but that we also address those agendas uh, and targets in an innovative and uh, integrated manner. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Kira, for another very inspiring presentation you gave. Uh, right now, we will be opening the discussion. We have heard really a lot about SDGs, policy processes behind equity was mentioned every second slide, if not every determinant structure, individual level, priorities, time priorities, pressure there. It's not just permacrise, what to do there with trust, with social commercial determinants, local implementation again and different sectors. Uh, then also Geneva Charter, so a lot coming up and uh, local level implementation seems really to be closest to the to the hands. But what, what the echoes in my mind is that we have on one side content and different contents in which we are operating NCDs, climate change, whatever else, but methodologies which we are using so that we we can do something substantial. So from the methodological point of view, from the practical approaches, what can we do, what can be done that we really go forward and achieve something, um, make change which would really be substantial? Are we satisfied in what societies we are living? Is enough to adapt, it's enough to mitigate, or do we need a substantial change of the society as such which would allow us to go in different direction as we are living it right now? I'm just wondering, any questions? I would kindly ask the speakers uh, if you can join me here. Knutinge, please, if you can, and Kira. <laughs> so if you have the time not staying here alone. And uh, if the questions are coming from the audience here or from the online, all are warmly welcome. And uh, those who will be responding will come to the stage. Oh. Oh, now we will just see how tired you are and if you need, if you can. Okay, I'm just wondering, uh, Dr. Ellen, are you already willing to speak or do we take a few questions? I know it's not very polite to just, if you're in the stress. Yes, if, if you can go, otherwise. Okay, we are adapting it a bit. <laughs> Thank you so much. And we will repeat the exercise at the end, uh, at the end of this intervention. Thank you. Um, sorry about this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think that you will get your slide. Yeah, and, um, cool. With us is Dr. Jessica Allen. Yeah, she's coming from. She's the deputy director of the Institute of uh, Health Equity at University College London. So happy to having you here, you and hope speak. that you accommodate so quick to this <laughs> situation of speaking. Thank you. Um, well, great, nice to be here. Uh, sorry about the rush. Uh, I was just going to reflect really on some of the work that we've been doing. So I work at the Institute of Health Equity, which is led by Michael Marmot. So I've been there since two thousand and eight. I'm working on trying to embed a social determinants of health approach to health inequalities in all different contexts um, and different types of organisations. And I just want to reflect on some of that because, of course, uh, we're talking today about NCDs, um, which has really been central to our work. Um, although, of course, with um, COVID, the inequalities 
um, and social determinants of health related to infectious diseases were also brought to the fore. Um, just to give a quick bit of context, the UK, um, and I'll be talking mainly about the UK, a little bit about Norway, because we did some work with the Norwegian government, the Department of Health here, um, on health inequalities. So we've got some data as well around that. Um, increases in life expectancy at birth are stalling in the UK since 2010. Um, and just for comparison, they haven't been in Norway. Um, they've been increasing steadily. So we know that some things have, some of the policy context in the UK has been very damaging to health um, and has widened health inequalities. So this is Norway. Um, and you can see life expectancy increasing steadily, but also um, widening. So life expectancy, sorry, increasing steadily, but health inequalities, this is related to level of education, also widening. Back to the UK, uh, actually England, and health inequalities have widened. In fact, for the more deprived, less wealthy communities, we can see significant declines in life expectancy on the left-hand side of this, of this graph. The most deprived people, um, significant declines in life expectancy um, and declines across the board for men. So some really worrying, uh, con concerning trends, and it's really, um, we'll relate it back to the social determinants of health and that rise in NCDs among those more deprived um, communities. Um, and this is back to Norway. You can see again, this is um, respondents who perceive their health as very good or good by educational level, those inequalities there, fairly static in Norway, but still fairly wide. Um, now, just to bring your attention to this, we did some work with a, a local authority in London, um, Waltham Forest, marked in grey on this, and we've compared it with other similar local authorities. So these are its closest statistical neighbours. Um, and this is under 75 mortality from respiratory disease. And you can see these wide inequalities across London. And in fact, we can see this for all uh, for all preventable, what we call preventable diseases, which are mainly NCDs, d diseases which are preventable by reasonable means as the definition. So just to dig down, Waltham Forest was slightly below the average for respiratory disease mortality in London um, compared with it. And compared with its statistical neighbours, but you can see here these enormously wide inequalities within Wolf and Forest. So this is at much smaller level within that local authority, and you can see the very close association with deprivation. And I'm really showing you this, I'm sure you're familiar with data of this kind, but to show how closely, even at very small levels, you can see these inequalities in preventable disease under 75, so we're not looking at life expectancy or even self-reported health here, we're looking at preventable mortality from NCDs um, within a one London borough. Um, and of course, we relate this back to those key social determinants of health. We call um, ours the Marmot 8, but um, other people have different ways of framing it. Um, the Norwegian um, Inequalities Review had these principles, but, you know, these key social determinants are phrased slightly differently, but this is the way that we, we phrase them. And there's an enormous body of evidence that these are the factors which are driving those inequalities that I've just shown you. So over many, many years, um, we've built this very strong body of evidence under these eight principles, and we know what to do within those eight principles now. We've worked, well, we kind of know what to do. We've worked with lots of different areas, places, countries, international organisations, and these eight principles really hold up quite well in all those different contexts. And there's lots of actions as well, which we um, can refer to, which have been effective in, in those. But we know how many different parts of a system in a place um, are needed to make those changes. So local government, um, healthcare, the voluntary community faith sector, public services, um, so educational, criminal justice, transport. We, we're always trying to bring these other services and, and sectors along with us to make the case why it's important for them, why it's a whole of society endeavour. Business in the private sector. Uh, we've recently been linking more with business in the private sector. Obviously, they have an enormous impact on health inequalities and NCDs uh, through the quality of employment, pay, conditions, and also their impact in places. And some of that... Um, 
can be really, really strengthen their role in improving those conditions and having this enormous societal impact on place. And then national government and national institutions. Um, in the UK, we haven't really had a close impact, trying to be polite, on the government uh, over the last few years, but we've worked with outside the government. It's actually been really effective because there are these different sectors and organisations and places. And um, I don't know if I've got the slide. Yeah, we've worked with over 40 local authority local authorities now there's more coming and getting on the phone every day saying can you help advise us can we learn from what's happened in other places we really want to do this the national context is not conducive to the kind of action that's needed to reduce health inequalities but we can do what we can firstly to mitigate some of the negative impacts of policies and secondly to actually take a really proactive place-based approach um, joining all those sectors um, Unfortunately, the list of obstacles is longer than the list of opportunities. That's um, not meant to be the case, but um, you'll see that they, they mirror each other, really. So we know that leadership, lack of leadership, is a huge barrier to, to work of this kind. And we know that strong leadership and leaders who are prepared to put their head above the parapet and really um, push organisationally to make the case, to, to go with the investment, um, can make a, a huge difference and we see that all the time how important that leadership and the capacity building within organisations and sectors how important that is politics of course this is highly political all these decisions um, in those key marmitate those key social determinants of health um, so we know that we we need a political framing to this actually so we always talk about social justice people say to us oh what's the cost efficacy of doing this um, what's the technical reasons for doing this and we're always saying this is actually first for social justice we need to remember that and have that as the priority and it does give you a bit of a pushback quite often but I think it's a really important thing we're doing this for reasons of social justice um, and I think making that case has actually strengthened the agenda over over the years weak partnerships between those different sectors. We need stronger partnerships. There's various technical mechanisms, budget sharing, shared agendas, strategies, etc., which can be really helpful in that endeavour. Data, where well, there isn't data, it's clearly an obstacle. In England, we're blessed with enormous amounts of data. That's not an obstacle, but we've worked in many parts of the world where there is very little data. So we know we need the data. It highlights the issues. People could be accountable and for evaluation. Time scales, long-term time scales for some of this are an obstacle, etc. So resources, I will mention money because it does require some investment. So we're always talking to the NHS in the UK and saying this is not only the right thing to do and you all care about health and they do, you care about equity and they do. Um, so for those reasons, they're bought into it. But then you obviously run straight up against the cost agenda. And so we show them this. If you look at this, the most deprived black dotted line, that's the costs to the NHS of treatment over the life course. And you can see far higher. And there's a gradient, the least deprived, the, the pale green solid line, and the most deprived, that dotted line. So there's huge differentials in cost. So we're saying you need to take action on the social determinants of health. It's not because people are using the NHS inappropriately, it's because they are sick. And they're sick earlier. And in order to reduce that, you need to work within places to improve the conditions and really lobby for that at government level, etc. Um, and we've had some success. I won't go into this in detail, but this is a local community and mental health trust in London that's taking action on the social determinants of health, working in a place, in this case, Luton, a kind of a London borough, outer London borough. Um, and they're working with employers to make the case for good quality employment. They're working with their own staff. Um, and clients. So we know that there's things that can be done. Businesses, I mentioned, I'm coming to the end. Uh, good quality work, absolutely vital. Health, uh, supporting products, goods and services, yes, absolutely essential. And also this influencing role, advocacy, lobbying, pay tax, please, um, assessing the environmental impact, uh, looking at the supply chain. What is the procurement? Are they adding social value? Are they procuring in a sensible way? Are the organisations that they're procuring from, uh, do they have good quality work? And we've seen some movement on this actually in the City of London, which is really positive. Um, and this is an example of where that's happening, uh, working across the city to get companies um, to improve conditions for what they call their hidden workforce, the security guards, the cleaners, the people in the supply chain. 
um, who are suffering from low pay, really poor quality work. Um, I just like this quote, so I'm going to be up, put it up here. Michael's been talking about this as well. To be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than, desp rather than despair convincing. So we know the problem. You all know the problem. We know what's driving the problem. And I'm going to finish with, we know what to do about it. So there's making the case that lobbying advocacy, um, and we can really, really make an impact, I think, it, variety of different ways, different sectors, different organisations, different places uh, to reduce those inequalities. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much again for very interesting inputs for our debate and discussion. And now Kira and Knutinge, can you join us again here at the stage? Uh, looking for the, for the questions from the audience, because now it seems really, as you said, what to do we know, but probably how to do it. What, what exactly, which uh, things to address? Do we respect those mechanisms, advocacy, governance, capacity, speed up? Uh, so how to find leverages to speed up? Um, anybody from the audience would like to ask the first question? Lorna, please. Hi, then. <laughs> just, just a bit, uh, wait a bit, because otherwise the, the, the audience on the web cannot. Hi, yeah, thank on. you all speakers for your inputs. It's Lorna from Public Health Scotland. Um, hi. So, one thing I noticed across all the inputs um, was um, participation and community participation um, and I wondered and there's also that that theme around a um, mistrust in governance and and pol politics and disengagement and with this this you know getting people on board and communities on board at, at small and and population level uh, does that do you have any comment about what you know the the interventions that you've you've been mentioning and how how that uh, community that voice and uh, the push from communities to have change in this direction for social justice is important and how you how you drive that because you get a lot of disenfranchisement and that actually drives the inequality as well so it's just if you have a comment on that who would like to go first? But you have to come here so that everybody can see okay. you. Can you yeah, just switch the places a bit? Thank you. Well, thank you for that uh, question. Um, one thing I thought was worth mentioning is uh, going back to the Norwegian Public Health Act, because what that did was that it took health and public health out of the domain of the health sector and put it under the uh, mayor or the leadership of the municipality. Uh, acknowledging that uh, for public health all the sectors are so critical. So the fact that, that when a new um, board of elected municipality members uh, convene for the first time in, uh, after the election, that they put public health on the agenda and then have uh, the four-year plan. And very often we see that uh, local municipalities also then do have public hearings and try to mobilize um, uh, the, the local community through that mechanism. So I think that is one yeah. proposed way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Knutinge. Yeah. Any experiences from... Yes, so I think with the um, Geneva Wellbeing Charter, I think that is a real recognition that we need to do things differently. And I think in, I think during COVID, I think what we did see was that uh, some of the guidance was uh, not necessarily developed hand in hand with the community. I mentioned that I lived in the Western Pacific region and what we saw was that that guidance did not speak to the realities of the communities. Um, so there was a recognition that, again, we need to think about how we establish more formalized mechanisms as well to engage with communities. And, and that is being done as we speak. But I certainly think that the network, of course, I'm coordinating that work network, so I am very biased, but I think it is a very powerful network, precisely because the mayors and local leaders are working so closely with communities. And I think our finest task, of course, is to ensure that we capture that knowledge, that community knowledge as well, so that the guidance and policies are much more a reflection of their uh, lived reality. So. Thank you so much. I'm just wondering, are we ever mentioning digital communities? We are in traditional world still. Do you have any comment on that? How do we 
tackle things which are happening in digital communities or anybody in the audience. It's the discussion among the speakers and the audience, or just a rhetoric at the moment. Any more questions? Thank you for the answers. Would you also like to add something? Please, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I just, I just make um, one or two comments. One is that, well, at least in the UK, when you talk to communities about health, quite often, almost always actually, people start talking about healthcare because that's very close association. But I think actually in a strange way, the, the experience over the last few years and the cost of living crisis and austerity has raised awareness and I think communities now very well understand how their living conditions, their poor quality housing, poor quality work are actually impacting on their health. And I actually think um, that, that that may, we hope, energise people and really encourage people to think about health and push and advocate and lobby for health um, outside of the healthcare system because that has been a block on some of the work that we've tried to do. And the second point is just the work that we've done, which hasn't been much, but it's been some and increasing with the community and voluntary sector has been incredibly helpful in um, all kinds of ways, but certainly bringing that community perspective. We're now working with lots of minority ethnic groups and they're really shifting the way um, that the, the, the approach that we've had is taken. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just very important. It's not very well done, I don't think. Um, and certainly in the UK, it's been very much a kind of top-down approach, hasn't it? But less in Scotland, maybe. <laughs> Thank you so much. Satisfied, Lorna, <laughs> coming from Scotland. <laughs> OK. Some more questions? Yes, please, Pia. Can you introduce yourself and then? Thank you. Thank you very much for your excellent speeches. My name is Pia Sundell. I come from Finland. I'm a member of the board of EuroHealthNet. I absolutely agree with everything you have said here today, and I, I think almost everybody in this room is agreeing. But unfortunately, everyone, those making the important decisions, they have other priorities than those that we would like to see. And um, special, especially being uh, questions regarding well-being and human rights are not very highly prioritized every day. Uh, especially now with the economic challenges and even challenges with the protection, outer protection as military and, and, and stuff. Will our aims be interesting enough is one of my questions. And how can we work harder together to aim and to protect and promote voices of the weak? Who will or how can we stand up for those people who, who are not strong enough? How can, you, 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 you named leadership. How, how can we create leadership that will promote social justice? Who would like to respond first? <laughs> Thanks, Pia, for the question. Yeah, are we active enough or are we passive? How do generations behave because we differ in the past and now? Do you have any answer to that? Uh, I'll, I'll have a go. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, this is just the approach that we've been taking at the Institute. So we've, you know, patchy success, but sometimes success. And I think pushing on other people's agendas, I do think, well, for example, with business, that they are increasingly recognising that they need people to be healthy. It's cynical, you know. And in many of them aren't evil monsters. They actually want people to be healthy generally. But from a business perspective, you know, for, for profit margins, they'll need those people to be healthy. Healthy. I pointed out about the demand on services and I think and the cost of that and I think there's an increasing recognition that poor health is really really expensive you know to individuals communities but also to the to the public purse um, and to businesses so we're pushing a bit on that and I'm hoping that that will encourage um, you know it sounds cynical but you have to push on these open doors or opening doors um, and this awareness in order to get the agenda. We talk about kind of smuggling the agenda in wherever we can. And in relation to leadership, I think, you know, it's great to have these individual brilliant leaders who are prepared to kind of stand up and do it, but we'll learn from them. And I think thinking about the levers that can be in place to support good leaders. So, you know, the regulations, the reporting requirements, the accountability mechanisms, we talk all the time about these um, um, the outcomes frameworks that they're operating to. So you can make these technical changes um, in accountability systems which, which really push forward. And I think, you know, if you're pushing in all these different kinds of directions, you can actually strengthen accountability um, organisationally. 
please, would you like to add, please? Uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, one thing is, I think we're too focused on health, um, and that we should approach other sectors uh, and colleagues in other areas uh, looking at their agenda, because very often it is, if they succeed, we succeed in public health as well. The other thing is, how can we, uh, to a large extent, uh, hear the voices of the underprivileged or vulnerable uh, groups? Uh, I think we um, need to have a better methodology or approaches to get their voices uh, heard. I have been um, coordinating a project called Co-Create where we've been working with young uh, people and there we have tried to design a safe space for young people to interact with adults from business communities or others. And I think uh, we need to further uh, think how can we create a safe and um, proper spaces for these voices to be heard uh, more than they are today. Thank Thanks. you so much, Katinga. Two very good answers to these difficult questions. Kira, would you like to add? Yes, and I'm excited to hear you're from Finland because, of course, you are leading by example in terms of your work on health and all policies. And uh, you will also know that that's work that we are really implementing at a rapid speed uh, at the World Health Organization. Uh, there are challenges, uh, but I, I would agree with uh, my fellow panelists here that I think the important thing here is to ensure that we don't just specifically focus on health and not specifically on disease, but again, shift that agenda. And I think we are seeing a shift and I think actually COVID-19 somehow also shed lights on those inequalities those that are most vulnerable and how we ensure that they actually have a place at the table uh, and we are doing everything we can to ensure that we establish these um, safe spaces that uh, was just mentioned um, we've just come out of a youth forum in Tirana where um, young people came together to put together their recommendations in terms of how they envisage the future in terms of well being uh, in terms of the planet. So again, it's just to say that we are moving beyond that disease focus. Um, so I think I, I am sort of optimistic. And I think we also have that specific focus on, you know, one of those uh, targets, which is on health and well being. Thank you so much. We have a question there in the uh, audience. Thank you, Harry Samsulikovic, Conclave European Dentist. First of all, Knutting, I think what you're saying about other sectors is very much upstream. And I think very much, you know, upstream of this is the way to go. Um, my question was, uh, WHO launched a health inequality data repository recently. And I think one of the pictures so showed data as challenges. And I think it's really, really a big, big challenge. So I'm wondering, so data respiratory could be good. But if it's not used, it's not good. Mm -hmm. It's like we can sleep on it. Uh, so I would like to ask, you know, what sort of strategy would it take to have evidence-based data? I think without data, we can't do anything, basically. And my second question is to Jessica, as an example. Um, Michael Marmot was here some months ago, and he, he, I have to try to pronounce it even, proportionate universalism, and to, to flatten the gradient. And could you give an example of that, please? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, speaking about the data and uh, how good the data should be so that we start acting, aren't we sometimes scared to start acting when we know that something is really detrimental to health and just be brave enough? Sometimes it seems that, uh, like Gauden said, time, urgency and everything. So, yeah, it's uh, important that we have the data, but also it's important that we act when we see that it's the action should be implemented. But please, uh, Jessica, you got the, the direct question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, proportionate universalism, yeah. I think, I mean, it's essential, really, but we have had universal policies, and we know that they can improve but not reduce the inequalities or flatten that gradient. Targeted programs um, seem like a good investment, a good way to target resources, but they lead to those cliff edges um, and to groups who just miss out suffering. So... Um, there's some good examples um, in public, particularly in public health, actually. Um, for example, smoke, some of the smoking cessation policy in the UK, where they've invested more in more deprived communities, but we have a universal approach to smoking cessation. Uh, further upstream, education policy um, or healthcare, I guess. You could see it as a universal free service 
um, but targeted to those who need it most. In this case, not targeted by deprivation, although there's a close association, but by ill health or educational need. So there are, I mean, it's perfectly possible. Um, and some of the obstacles that people push back a bit about it is it's expensive um, to have a universal but targeted approach um, but it's also you just say it's also very expensive not to because as people are missing out you're just creating new problems more people falling off that cliff edge so um, and also it's perfectly possible to do this and to monitor for it we've just talked about um, there's a lot of data in the UK so I think that it's, it's entirely possible um, and it's a really really important strategy for reducing health inequalities we won't do it without that approach thank you thank you so much and optimistic that it can be done if yes. we start and do properly. I'm just wondering, my last question to the, audience, to the, to the panel, and uh, if you have any more questions uh, from the audience, write to your health net for ideas and for further discussions in this area. Uh, is, uh, we are speaking about targets, about the evidence, about the actions, about how to respond, uh, but mainly we are speaking, I'm going back to what Knut Inge said, we are speaking about health or we are speaking about the economic growth, is that all, how can we prove that something is really growing in the social capital, in the cultural capital, in the environmental capital, not just economic capital? Can we equalize that? What would that mean for, for that, this, such a discussion? Is there maybe a way forward? Just a sentence for the goodbye. Um, I think you should measure how well a society is doing by how good its health is and how equal its health is. Um, and that seems to hold up, actually, if you look at countries I've just tried to illustrate in the case of the UK, things are going wrong in the social economic policy sphere, impacts on health. So we can see that time and time again. So measure society's effectiveness um, by how good the health is and how equal it is. OK, thank you so much. Tira. Yeah, no, I, and again, I'd like, I think I'll go back to the notion of well-being because, and, and I think well-being is something that all sectors can agree to. And I think that's why I think it's such a powerful way of, of moving forward. Um, so again, I think, you know, as we start to unpack this Geneva Charter of, of well-being, I think uh, this could be quite a powerful way forward. Yes, thank you so much. I, I also think that Geneva Charter is an excellent development in health promotion. Please, Knutinga, your final word. You are the host here. <laughs> Well, thank you. I just uh, uh, agree what has been said. And, and I'd like to um, pick up what you said in your presentation. You talk about social, social justice. I think that really is a key uh, concept here. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. OK, thank you for, the, for, for participating in this session. Now we will have a break of half an hour, and we will meet again at uh, 15.45, am I right? 15.45, back. We are starting promptly at that time. And enjoy the break and discussions, and hope that many more questions will arise during the discussion. Thank you. Hello and welcome to colleagues in the room and also to colleagues online. So my name is Samin Azam, I'm from Public Health Wales and I'm also a member of the EuroHealthNet board. And I have the pleasure of talking to you this afternoon and introducing four excellent colleagues on the topic of climate change. So climate change is a threat to public health. It disrupts human and national and natural systems, it affects our health and well-being, both physical and mental. Since pre-industrial time, global surface temperatures have increased by 1.09 degrees already, and that is in light of the Paris Agreement to not exceed 1.5 degrees. We are seeing extreme weather events already, floods, heat waves, wildfires. It is affecting us in terms of food supply, air pollution, infectious diseases, to name but a few. Inequalities runs deep in this agenda. So we know 45% of global greenhouse gas emissions are from the richest 10% of our populations. But it affects, by the, it affects the poorest in our society. There are also impacts on nature. We are taking more than nature can supply. So research has shown that we need 1.6 planet Earths to maintain our current living standards. So now it is critical for policymakers to work together across sectors to mitigate and adapt to challenges in a way that helps protect health and reduce inequalities. 
So today we will be talking about, talking about how policymakers and the wider health community can drive the climate change agenda and play a more prominent role in COP28 and achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement and also the European Green Deal. So we are joined by four excellent speakers. We have Dr. Maria Naira, we have Professor Tanya Winter, Dr. Remco van der Pass, and Dr. Marco Martuzzi. So first of all, we will be hearing from Dr. Mar Maria Naira. She's joining us by video. Um, she's a WHO Assistant Director General from the Healthier Populations Division, and she is also a member of the Advisory Panel for UN Global Climate Action Awards. So Dr. Naira will talk a little bit about the role of public health institutes and the health community in driving a green and healthy transition. So over to the video. Greetings from Geneva. Hello, Oslo, and thanks for inviting me to this EuroHealthNet Summit. Uh, we are just finishing in Geneva the World Health Assembly. We have the opportunity to put very high on the agenda of the Ministers of Health attending the World Health Assembly, climate change and health. Yes, climate change is affecting our health in a very dramatic way. Yes, we have plenty of scientific evidence demonstrating that, and therefore we need to be prepared to respond. How do we respond? One, we need to make sure that at the COPs, when the negotiations about climate change are taking place, we need to provide the health arguments as a very strong motivation to take more action to tackle the causes of climate change. If we tackle the causes of climate change, if we, if we accelerate a transition to clean sources of energy, one of the immediate benefits will be the reduction of air pollution, and air pollution is killing 7 million people every year, in addition to cause enormous suffering in terms of chronic, non-communicable diseases, and the cost that the health system is already paying. Second, we need to make sure that we have the countries endorsing ATTACH, which is the platform created and, 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 and provided the Secretariat by the World Health Organization, looking at climate resilient, low carbon sustainable health systems. I need all of you endorsing that because we need to move on decarbonizing our own health system, reducing the, 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 the emissions from our own health system, but at the same time, gaining access to clean sources of energy for those countries that are not contributing to the emissions, but they need to gain access to energy. Clean sources of energy, solar can be a solution if they want to keep providing uh, uh, the, 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 the health uh, and the people that is trusting us for that. And third, we need to mobilize the health community, the non-communicable diseases community, because we have a lot in common. One of the risk factors for non-communicable diseases is air pollution. A lot to gain on going to the COP28. This year, as you probably know by now, we will have a health day and ministers of health going on into a ministerial, and therefore we need to make sure that our health system will be fitting for the 21st century. We need to make sure that we will have uh, a possibility to, to obtain, obtain health benefits from tackling the causes of climate change, and third, making sure that we will have the financing to support all of this movement to zero uh, carbon for our health system. I wish you all the best. I hope we will be ensuring this uh, response at the level that is needed for the, comparing with the magnitude of the problems we are facing, the triple crisis we are facing, one of them being climate change, the other one pollution. The responses are there and the health system can provide a very strong motivating argument to do more, to take more action. Very successful meeting and thanks again for inviting me. Very many thanks to Dr. Maria Naira. So it was fantastic to hear that call to action to participate and attach, and also really good to hear some insights in terms of COP28. Now I'm going to move on to my second colleague, Professor Tanya Winter, who will be talking about energy and social inequality. Pro Professor Winter is from the Center of Development and the Environment at the University of Oslo, and head of INCLUDE, which is the Research Centre for Socially Inclusive Energy Transitions. So, Professor Winter, I invite you to join the floor. Thank you. 
Many thanks for this invitation. And it's, it's, a, it's somehow unusual for me to engage with health people. I'm working very much with energy sector people. So I think this is a really important time for bridging of sectors. As I heard from the last uh, discussion you had, uh, there were calls to, to engage with other sectors. Yes, yeah, so I was, I'm an anthropologist and I've been working with energy in Africa, India, um, and also in Norway. So in Africa, the, the idea has been to how, to we, how can we get access to electricity and do that in socially inclusive ways. For example, how can we empower women as we provide more electricity? Today, I will, t I will give you some snapshots of, uh, from both contexts um, in this talk on energy and social inequality. And I think we can't st start any discussion about inequality without having a look at the global picture. So we need uh, more and we need less at the same time of energy. And the reason being energy accounts for more than 70% of all emissions. And this map is showing, you know, the darker red are showing the, those countries with the highest emission per capita. Um, while the, the, the pale ones, and we don't have the figures for all countries, but the pale ones, also sub-Saharan, is the problem that they lack often access to basic services. So um, 800 million are, don't have electricity access still. So there is also a need for more. So this is the dilemma we have. In addition, we know the, the, how countries are also hit by environmental problems, drought, drought and, um, and cyclones and uh, water and so on. It's, it's also unequally distributed. And finally, there is also the, nat the resources that we expect to put into the renewable sector. You know, there's very much trust in technology and, and this, this we will just decarbonize by, by starting to use uh, solar uh, energy and wind instead of fossil. But those materials co also come from somewhere and they have, they have local uh, impacts where the extraction is going on. So also an kind of unequal distribution of burden. Now, in the Include Center, we focus on, um, uh, on justice and we will just, just to legitimize why, why we think it's important to plan energy in a just way. It's both because we have so little time with these urgencies, both for nature and climate crisis, that we, we don't simply don't, we don't have time to fail. And the social movements are coming up. This is a, a photo from a, a, a very big Facebook group in Norway demanding cheaper electricity last winter. So, but also there are protests now, you know, for climate and also against climate measures. So politicians are more and more realizing we need social acceptance when we have these, these measures we want to do. But then energy justice is to us what somehow the key here to how to, to, um, to, provide rec to do research and then provide recommendations. And we have these three, three questions that, this, that we use in all kinds of projects on First on the distribution, what is at stake? Costs and benefits, how are they benefit, benefiting different groups? It can also be geographical areas. And who are recognized in these processes? And typically the Sami population, uh, in terms of the force and wind power controversy, they, their interests were not recognized from the start enough to, to have impact on the end results. And the High Court ruled that their interests had not been uh, uh, recognized in the process. And then there's this issue of procedural. So just asking these three questions, anytime we look at a particular technology, uh, policy, or anything that is going to implement um, a more sustainable future, we think these are, these are keywords. And it's not that we know in advance what will be just, but it's just to have the attention on these questions. So let, let me give one glimpse from the, the southern, uh, a southern context where I had the privilege to live a year in the Zanzibar village and also follow the, over 10 years what happens when you get electricity for the first time. So a very important developmental positive effect of having electricity access was directly to use it for healthcare in the village. So you had the cooling for equipment, you have the examination light for when labor, giving labor, uh, labor at night time, sterilizing equipment. It also became a kind of attraction for nurses to come to the village that had electricity. And then there was access to now uh, water pumps, so clean water rather than the salty water they had been drinking before, so also a direct health uh, impact. And an interesting uh, thing regarding uh, the collection of water was that when the mothers did not have to go and, you know, to the wells and queue up and, and spend all the time on, um, on the water collection, which, the, which their daughters often helped them doing, so when they got a tap in the village, the daughters were sent to school to the same extent as boys. And more lately, when, you know, also now having access to phones or co computers, there are also direct uh, health effects specifically for the phones uh, in, in case of illnesses, uh, emergencies, you know, people live on a very long distance from each other. 
Um, but what electricity did not provide here, and that is also a main international challenge, you know, with the indoor air pollution, uh, um, women cooking inside with the, with use of firewood. It, it, that was somehow the main practice that did not change. It's very hard to change, also because the firewood is considered as free, although women spend, you know, they have uh, neck problems walking uh, and collecting it. But compared to electricity, which is expensive, also paid, oops, paid by the man, sorry, then you have a kind of conflict and also the issue of taste and food is, is a very, very hard field to change. So in my, based on this case and also other places we've been uh, looking at, the, the, key, the key to actually um, equal access to services is through um, functioning public services, so health, water, schools. But unfortunately, the Sustainable Development Goal number seven on energy does not mention uh, public services at all. It's very focused on individual households. And if, if energy, the energy goal was more interested into, in, uh, in this kind of infrastructure and, and services, I think so much more could, have, could be done. Now moving to the uh, in European context, this is the list of, um, from Eurostat on, on the energy poverty in different countries. And you can see from this definition that health, uh, health is directly associated with energy poverty. So it occurs when energy bills represent a high percentage of consumers' income, typically 10% or more, or when they must reduce their household energy consumption to a degree that uh, negatively impacts their uh, health and well-being. So in the, I think that that is also why um, in the Western context, Nor Nor Norwegian context, that focusing on energy poverty is really a, an opening door to, to mix different sectors working on a particular problem for this particular group. So um, in Norway, it's not simply on the agenda yet, as we've seen. So we saw the need to actually define it in the Norwegian encyclopedia so that school children can know this is the concept. It's been, you know, it's a common common concept in the in Europe now and also in the UK for for many over decades, but in Norway it's still somehow not on the agenda. So this is the quote: "I buy less food. I prioritize my spending so so as to appear to have um, a normal life, a normally functioning person, just like anybody else." So this is a quote from a study in Oslo on energy poverty a couple of years back. So you can see that buying less food, eating less during winter months. When the, when the electricity is, is high, but also the psych, psych, um, psycholog psychological cost of not well, trying to appear as everybody else, but not re really striving and working hard to, to appear that way. So in that study, they, um, it was a small qualitative study, and we have now started a PhD and we'll do it more systematically. But um, so when people were recruited to this, um, they, were, they were typically pensioners or so, receiving social supports. So people were invited, have you had problems paying your bill? That was the kind of people who they wanted to recruit. So they eat less during winter months uh, and they have in a, in a adequate, uh, an adequate heating, also re experiencing physical pain. And people with chronic illnesses were more vulnerable to this um, living in a too cold uh, home. And some would stay in bed until two o'clock, you know, midday, just to, to avoid having to put on the, the, um, the, the oven uh, in, the, in the morning. And then the social isolation that, that appears from this stigmatization. So when we see, look at the, the policies here, this is the, the only policy that we see it directly addressing this group is the social security policy. Those working with all kinds of uh, allowances, social security support, uh, booster, all these things but it's connected not at all to energy sector. Energy sector just thinks about, think about people as kilowatt hours. No, it makes no, no distinction between uh, users. So to sum up now, um, I would say to, you know, to the approach is first of all to acknowledge that this is the social and health implications of energy. And uh, yes. So both for researchers and, and policy makers. And how we can create, start with the question, how we can create an inclusive and healthy services and local communities where these health services, in the, especially in the third world countries, but the groups, you know, healthy, healthy everyday lives to people. And then we have to think across the sectors. And I, I think in the case of electricity and energy in our context, the municipality could play a much more important role because they are close to the people. They know very much about who are the vulnerable groups, how are the housing conditions, and these, these things are all linked. So I think um, rather than having the old centralised system that we have, the municipalities could play a much more uh, active role and being, being given that mandate. 
And for the energy sector people, I would say, you know, stop imagining that people are, are this ideal and flexible electricity consumer. Typically the resource man, that's a concept in the literature, typically a white, very technologically interested person who wants to really engage with anything to do in the system. And rather in focus instead on this distributional justice at that every citizen should have uh, affordable access to energy, starting with that affordability and the link between actually um, getting enough so, uh, as a minimum level. And the design of the system, very much top-down, you know, from the Trondheim environment in Norway, a technological uh, focus so, uh, and also cost-benefit analysis to have a more inclusive process. We have some examples of, of this being possible also in the electricity sector. And uh, acknowledge the needs and capacities of different groups as somehow maybe the, the starting point, but we should never forget that. So... Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. That was absolutely fascinating. It was brilliant to see how we are bridging sectors, the energy and the health sector. And it was also really good to see real life examples and the impacts it's having on people. Health, energy and inequalities, it was really brought to life in your presentation. And something really struck home with me. You mentioned about energy poverty, and that's something we are really seeing in the UK. So people are making difficult choices. And on some occasions, they have no choices at all. So I thought you brought that out beautifully. So thank you very much. I would now like to introduce our second speaker. So Dr. Remco van der Pas is a senior research fellow at the Centre for Planetary Health Policy. He will speak to us about reorientating policies and targets for healthier people and the planet. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay. Good uh, afternoon. Good to be here. Remco van der Pas, Dutch by citizenship, working in Berlin for the uh, Center for Planetary Health Policy, which is a think tank linked to the German Alliance on Climate and Health, a uh, new member of EuroHealthNet. So, a pleasure to be uh, to be here. Um, I'm a public health physician by training and a global health policy researcher um, and developed in, in, in that way and I teach also on global health at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp. Um, I will talk to you today about, and I think I need to swift, shift, I talk to you today about the need for the public health community to engage with the economics of uh, the transition that is uh, required. So I'm, I'm going to talk about the beyond growth drive that is currently taking place and to see how we relate and, and discuss what is possible for us to, to make our health, our public health argument uh, there. Um, as Dr. Gordon Galea mentioned, and he used the word permacrisis, um, I think that's the rightly uh, set wh where we are at the moment. Um, it's waves of challenges that are now um, appearing at the local but also more at the transnational um, in, in the transnational sphere due to our globalized environment so we need to we cannot just deal with one of those challenges we need to in at, at several levels we need to engage with it and that's a very hard task to do i think from a development or, or let also from a medical perspective because we're so much focused on targeting problems with single solutions and, and, and the more structural and interrelated challenges. That's, that's the challenge that we, that we have. This is coming from COVID-19, um, but we, yeah, we, we have to deal with these um, limit, these, these, these boundaries that we're now overshooting. And that's where um, the debate about growth and limits to growth is taking place because actually this uh, image is not that new. In this, there was the, 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 the Limits to Growth report by the Club of Rome 50 years ago that was basically saying we're overshooting uh, boundaries if we keep on developing as we're doing now. There will be limited resources, there will be limits also to food output. We, we need to deal in a coherent way with the problematic as if they were uh, talking about it uh, now. And the interesting part is that um, I think we've been pushing it away for all those 50 years because there was, of course, there, there was possibilities to innovate and to, and to push the, the, the ecological challenges 
forward, um, but the research on planetary boundaries, I assume that most of you know about it from Johan Rockström, who was at the Resilience Center in Stockholm and now in Berlin, shows that we're overshooting several of those ecological boundaries. It differs, of course, locally vis-a-vis -vis, uh, 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 at the planetary level, but the effect in a complex ecological system is seen at the planetary level. Um, at the same time, and I think last week they showed that now seven of eight planetary boundaries are being uh, crossed and that, that we go faster as we thought we were thought we were going so this it's not only about climate change there is there is a biodiversity loss there is the acidity of the of the oceans that is increasing there is the access to clean water there's a plastic pollution and although they receive single attention we need to look more at the structural drivers why we've come to this problem in the first place and then engage with it as a as a public health community um, we use in uh, at our center um, the term health within planetary boundaries. So planet, planetary health for us is working on health within planetary boundaries. In fact, it's the health and all policies, health equity agenda that we've all been working on, but it's making sure that that's within those ecological limits. Uh, and then also working on the social, social foundations and ensuring that they, that they are being uh, um, protected and that are being harnessed um, both at the local level but also in international solidarity. This is also the well-being, the economy of well-being that the, the, this community is talking about. Um, the question is then how, how to do that in a time that is ra asking for these urgent questions. Now this is, so I was at the Beyond Growth conference in the European Parliament two weeks ago, where, where the, the, the debate is now, that was actually how, what kind of economic models should we further to do exactly, to stay within that, in that, in that donut economic safe belt. And this is um, a slide from Daniel O'Neill, where he basically is about the number of ecological boundaries transgressed and the number of social thresholds achieved. And they look at the, the, the different bubbles and the size represent countries and the red ones are in Europe and you see that especially of course the social threshold is, is made is met for many of us but the ecological boundaries are, are transgressed so we have to scale we have to scale back we need to go back within those boundaries to be able to uh, uh, to sustain a prosperous life prosperous life and health in any in any case so it's not only a development agenda at the social side, but it's also the development agenda is also to stay within those boundaries in Europe and other middle and high income countries. The question is then, and this is a very heated debate, how to do that? Um, and then, the, and I've been interested in, in the economics of public health and, and health and investment over the last, over the last uh, decade. Um, the, the, the question is what would be then, what would be the pathways um, and the economic choices made to, um, to sustain the ecological and, and to realize that economics is not a, a linear um, input-output type of um, discipline. In fact, it's a social discipline. It's very much related to the ecological and social basis of life. And we seem to have forgotten that. That's what the ecological uh, economists will, will tell us. And one of the key arguments that they make is, look, if you, if you grow economic growth the way we know it now, in a capitalist way, consumption and production, there is energy required for it. Physically, we cannot keep growing, especially not with those agendas. So um, there's a whole debate about decoupling relative decoupling or, or absolute decoupling. We cannot, in our economic growth models, we cannot decouple relatively fast enough to go into those boundaries. It's like, someone like Jason Hickel calls it, it's like running down a uh, escalator that is, that is going up. So, then this, and then there's a whole debate about, okay, should we act actively degrow and shrink our economies in a, in a democratic way in the high-income countries? Should it be a steady-state economy that we remain within 
that belt that I just showed, or should it be more of a green growth, innovative, inclusive agenda, which is more like the European Green Deal? That's a debate. Um, I adhere, and this was then also presented to, to this trajectory, because I think the urgency is such that we need to do it. And interestingly, from the, uh, from the uh, there's a care agenda to it. So this is work by, by Tim Jackson, where he says, care is the invisible heart of the economy. We don't see it, we don't calculate it, it's not part of GDP, but informal care, unpaid care, often gendered care is supporting the capitalist growth that we're seeing now, and we need to invest much more in that unpaid uh, care work, allow people to care for their children, to have time to work in their societies, reduce working hours and focus much less on, on productivity growth and on the consumption of things that we don't really need, but do things that matter, because that's what care is about. And I think this is an entry point for our uh, public health community. So the argument that they make is, um, so th there's a, there is a statement coming from that conference, the Wellbeing Economy Alliance contributed to it, where they focus on these four principles. I'm not going to read them out all um, as they're written there. It's on biocapacity, fairness, well-being for all, and the role of citizen assemblies as a key strategic point for the transition. And I would then be interested to discuss what would it mean for the healthcare sector and for the public health community. So that's what I... Um, I wrote some, some ideas and uh, thinking down here. So the healthcare sector itself, as Maria Nera was mentioning, it should be resilient, uh, low carbon intensive, etc. But it would, it would, if you think about it, there's a whole transformation required. It needs to be much more simplified. Primary healthcare, this is the Alma Ata declaration. Um, we need to also in our education focus much more on the community and on the, uh, on the environmental and, and, and the social. But often we are driven now by the, by the, by the medical product protocols and the, and the bi biomedicalization that we also see now after COVID-19. Huh? So that's, that's why I call it, it's politically, it's, we, need to, we need to push back a little bit towards this, let's say, growth of the healthcare sector, which is not always in the interest um, for people, but there's a lot of vested interest in the healthcare sector itself. And this, uh, let's say, uncomfortable truth, we need to engage with. Um, and that would mean dealing with those four elements at the, at the same time, not only the biocapacity part, but it's about the fairness, it's how do we re redistribute resources vis-a-vis -vis access to healthcare, the intellectual property debates in relation to, uh, to COVID-19. Um, how can we argue that there needs to be investment in fiscal space, even though that it's overshooting fiscal uh, deficits or budgetary uh, issues? Huh? So that's a political economy debate that we need to engage with. The whole well-being protection, the whole well-being for all uh, entry point, which is, which is about time and subsidizing informal uh, care, um, how, to, how to, can we work as the healthcare sector also supporting working with um, local food production uh, markets, etc., and, uh, and support that. And, and, and um, importantly, the whole citizen assemblies, the whole democratization part, the involvement, the participation element, that we, we talk about it, we see it, we, you were referring to it also, there's, of course, there's groups like Extinction Rebellion and others as social unrest. Let's start to talk. It's deliberative democracy. And health is really an entry point there, also to make shared decision-making. Um, so that's, that's something I would argue for. The how we're going to do that, of course, it's, it's our community. It's about evidence, generation, about involvement, about demanding for political leadership and, and putting that agenda forward. But it's, it's, it's now with the urgency also allying us with a, a movement and, and a demand by citizens to really change things. And 15 years ago, I would be rather inclined to say, okay, there's some gradual times, but we have, there is urgency at the moment in, um, uh, in this agenda. So we need to 
yeah, we need to uh, engage with with the with the drive and and with the how and what we can uh, we can see. And this is some uh, last references on pieces written on what I presented. Thank you, Dr. Rem Remco Pass. That was absolutely fantastic in terms of talking to us about moving beyond a focus on our economy and how we need to take an integrated approach in terms of planetary boundaries. And you gave us some really interesting points about the pathways and the choices we have to make and need to think about as societies and how we need to measure what's really important. And there are some really challenging things as well in terms of actions for the health sector, so thank you so much. So our final speaker for today is Dr. Marco Martuzzi. I invite him down. He is the Director of the Environment and Health Department at the ISS. And he will be talking about the role of public health in shaping and driving the climate and health research and action agenda. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation um, in this um, very nice uh, uh, seminar today. Um, and I learned a lot and I, it was very pleasurable, interesting, and it also makes my life um, easy in a sense because many of the things that I'm going to, to share with you have been already said or, or there are close links to what uh, previous speakers have uh, presented. Um, <clears throat> so. I'll start, however, by um, um, advertising a little bit the work that National Institute of Health across the world uh, do. Um, we are in ISS, is the National Institute of Health of Italy, uh, and together with many other uh, such uh, institutes. Um, there's a federation, YAMFI, an association of them, and <clears throat> there's been quite a bit of work on uh, climate change and health. And you see this is the... <coughs> the um, slide that summarizes the, the work that uh, Yanfi has been doing and uh, um, I encourage you to, to look them up because it's uh, a very nice uh, set of resources. You see it's all um, framed uh, nicely in, in a One Health uh, type of uh, scheme. Uh, there's a part of uh, on research and evidence, one on uh, monitoring, uh, one on, on, on action. Um, and action and implementation, I'm, I'm glad that we're talking about that today because <clears throat> it's really, uh, I think, uh, crucial in, in this uh, area. So what I want to do is, is really uh, today talk about um, how proper um, framing of the issues can, can help us uh, promote better uh, uh, action. And as I mentioned, several things have been said already. Uh, so uh, the, these are the, <coughs> the planetary boundaries that the uh, previous speaker referred to. So it's not only climate change, it's a set of um, issues that have to do with global deterioration of, of, um, uh, of uh, the ecosystems. Um, and one example specifically is just one that uh, I picked out, out of, uh, for no particular reason. I mean, there are many examples like this. Um, give gives an idea of the degree of um, severity and also kind of... Uh, uh, things that we were not very prepared to, to think. Uh, the collapse of biodiversity <coughs> could result in, in a, a collapse of uh, pollinating insects and uh, resulting in turn in, in a loss, a catastrophic loss of uh, food production. So these are the kind of issues that could be triggered, are being triggered in a sense, by uh, global, um, <coughs> um, uh, the, the global crisis. And um, I think against this, con uh, against this kind of issues, we have to really be um, careful about the way, th about the context. Th this, this is the context we are operating in. Uh, you can imagine how public health is affected in, in a million ways. And um, we should really pay attention to what the questions are <laughs> and who has them. Uh, typically, I come from, a, from, I'm an epidemiologist. I've been working in this area for, for 30 years. Uh, and for many years, we've been trained to, uh, to look at a question that goes like, what is the evidence of this factor causes this outcome? Um, and this has generated a big machinery of methodology, and it's very rigorous and, and valuable methodology, like the hierarchy of, of uh, evidence, the models of risk assessment, of cost-benefit analysis. <coughs> uh, 
it, it has tended this to, to, towards the separation of, of facts and values, which is a bit, which is actually very artificial. I think we need to, to reconcile uh, these two um, issues, these dimensions. <coughs> and um, for example, thinking uh, air pollution has been mentioned a, a few times today. Uh, we have all the estimates about the, the million extra deaths uh, per year uh, due to air pollution. But if you decrease air pollution, um, you typically <coughs> through transport, for example, you almost inevitably decrease noise and accidents. So there are many co-benefits in, in most, if not all, of these uh, actions. There's this issue of co-benefits that comes in, uh, which uh, is a very strong argument for, for, uh, for public health and health advocates. Uh, in this respect, we did some work on, uh, um, uh, we advised the Ministry of, um, of Health in Italy <coughs> about uh, uh, mitigation policies. And, and uh, uh, the, the main top the areas of, of action that are, are always uh, considered are transport, energy production, agriculture, and nutrition. Now, for each of these and many uh, and several others, <coughs> you can look at the, the gain in terms of emissions, and that's the main uh, metric in a sense. But you can also look at the benefits in terms of health. So uh, transport, energy, and agriculture, they all can provide uh, strong uh, returns in, in terms of health, depending on... on uh, so it, one can be driven to, to looking at the mitigation policies that maximize the kind of uh, uh, health co-benefits. I put agriculture and nutrition in red because it's an area that uh, in my experience, at least traditionally, has been a bit neglected in, in environment and health, but it's a massive, um, there are massive impacts and massive potential benefits and co-benefits that can be uh, reached uh, through um, action in, in the food system that combines, of course, with, with nutrition. So it's, it's an area that re deserves, in my opinion, a lot of additional effort. And, um, and um, for example, if you look at the uh, emissions for, for the production of proteins for, for human nutrition, you see the phenomenal uh, difference between <coughs> how much um, um, emissions are involved in uh, CO2 emissions in this case, but uh, greenhouse uh, gases in general, um, <coughs> uh, depending on, on how you produce 100 gram of uh, protein from, from beef to um, vegetable production. So it, it's a huge um, uh, differential, which uh, in turn would imply if you, if you increase, the, the, if you shift a little bit the balance here, would increase a much uh, healthier nutritional nutrition pattern for, for many populations. So we have this tendency, which has been pointed out by <coughs> many, and this is an example of this restricting, uh, it's been mentioned already a few times today, this, this um, tendency we have uh, to focus on some, some specific aspects, typically the aspects that we are best at dealing with, we can measure, we can estimate, our models are, uh, w work well, uh, but we, we often fail to see the bigger picture, the, the level at which the, the questions are the most relevant and the most um, promising and valuable to, to address. So I think we really need, and again this has been mentioned already, we need to, to, to invest in culture, tools, methodology, education on more system thinking in, in public health. Uh, health is clearly one of the many complex systems uh, involved. It's not a complicated, it's a distinction in the, in the dedicated literature. Complicated uh, systems are those machines, even for, for how, however complicated they are, you can command and control, they have a purpose, you, you know what to expect. Uh, health and um, economics and, and environment and food production uh, belongs to, to, assist, to assist complex systems where you have non-linear behaviors, adaptive responses, feedback loops, tipping points, you cannot really predict um, what's going to happen next uh, with, with accuracy. And, um, you, you have to shift a little bit for the idea of reducing, um, reducing uncertainty, uh, which is always you know, an ideal goal in research, 
uh, you, you, it's more about uh, embracing the complexity that underlies these uh, systems. So it's, it's a shift from, from identifying the, the silver bullet, the optical, uh, the, the, the perfect uh, cost-benefit analysis, the, the maximizing some function, but rather to, to, to govern uh, a process. Um, a very influential author in complex system theory, Donella Meadows, uh, used the expression dancing with complex systems, which I think captures the idea very well. And, and to finish, <coughs> complex systems, um, and this has been formulated in many ways uh, again today. Um, if you want to govern, uh, bring, bring uh, your complex system in a certain direction, of course, that's what we want to do. We want to help move, push these systems towards a healthier uh, direction and more equitable. Um, there's little effect in, in touching the, the elements of the system, in reducing the um, individual exposure we heard uh, earlier today uh, about you know, the, the, the little efficacy of, of uh, uh, intervening at the, at the individual level for, for NCDs. Uh, there's much more uh, of a, an effect uh, intervening on the connections between the element of a complex system. Um, but the best is to, to go and, and uh, do something and, and tinker, in a sense, uh, at the level of the, the system function or purpose, if you can see it, because it's very often hidden. And I guess this relates very closely with what we heard just uh, now about uh, the underlying economic models that uh, uh, are one of the, the drivers of, of our uh, social uh, systems. GDP versus other uh, metrics, We've been saying this for some time now, including previous work I used to do it with WHO about the economics uh, of, um, of environment and health, which is clearly a very important um, dimension. But as I mentioned, it's very often driven by this idea of uh, making the assessment, finding the, the optimal, uh, the optimal uh, uh, point in, 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 a, in a function, which is typically uh, tends to hide a number of important uh, uh, dimensions. <coughs> So, uh, to finish, <coughs> uh, one of the questions for this meeting was how to step up uh, public health work and environment and health. Uh, I think primary prevention is really a key concept that we need to always keep in mind, revisit, emphasize, because if, you do, if you're serious about primary prevention, you have to do a realistic description of reality, and that is complex. Uh, appropriate framing of these questions, Considering things like co-benefits, uh, it's similar to what we've been doing over the years on health and all policies and many other similar equivalent approaches. So I think we have to strengthen this kind of uh, view of, of public health and the way it relates to uh, all the rest. And with that, I think I'll stop. Thank you so much, Dr. Martuzzi. So from that, it was wonderful to have a spotlight on biodiversity loss. I thought the co-benefits as a frame for policy and action really helps us to frame our thinking to move forward. And I was surprised to see subsidizing fossil fuel and, and the degree to, that, to which that happens. And I think one of your slides on systems thinking was absolutely fascinating and about the culture change that's needed. Um, and you mentioned embracing complexity, and I would say that we in public health are ideally placed for that. We deal with complexity all the time. So I think public health is well placed to be influencing and being part of this agenda. So I'd like to invite all three speakers to join me on the floor and open it up to questions from the audience. Um, we've had three really good presentations and a wonderful video. So I'm sure there's lots of questions out there. And there's also a roving mic. So are there any questions? Well, whilst you're thinking, I have one to start us. So um, we talked a lot about mit mitigation, and I was wondering whether anybody had a view about adaptation as well, because that's one of the things that we need to sort of think about too. So we did touch upon it, but I was just wondering if any of the speakers had any views on that, if, if that was an area. Or perhaps, ah, thank you. <laughs> um, 
So both in the in the European and the international sphere, there's a lot of talk about how to deal with health emergencies and building resilient health systems uh, within the community health system global. There's a lot of talk about how what primary health care and hospitals can do to be more resilient vis-a-vis -vis, uh, um, health threats. And it focused then also on becoming um, low carbon intense in the way it's, it's being, it's, it's functioning, etc. But it, this is to say that in many places in the world, primary health care is very low carbon intense. It's, it functions on, on, on basic uh, care. So moving to basic primary health care and, and basic public health functions is a, really a way to uh, to deal with the, with the climate uh, crisis, I would say. Secondly, um, there is the, there's all the discussion about the environmental impact of pharmaceutical uh, production and how to deal how to deal with that. And that's that's a specific uh, thing we could look into to to see what can be done indeed to deal with uh, lowering the impact of uh, of let's say the runoff of chemicals into wastewater, etc. Well, so having been have been having been to the Sundarban Islands in the West Bengal in India, then we looked at how can also solar power at the local level help them when there are uh, disasters coming, and then the problem turned out to be that when the disaster is coming, it's just being cloudy for a week, so the solar won't last them. So the most important part was to actually be able to inform people by mobile phone in advance ahead of when it's just coming. But I think in a, in a more European context, maybe the the um, you mentioned the UK case, and there were speculations in the UK, UK press that maybe more people died from energy poverty uh, last last winter than COVID. That was at least a question asked in the press. So I, I think to to uh, and and when you talk about this, you know, interesting, very interesting talk you made on the on the boundary and the the degrowth literature here. And, uh, the, you know, there is a sustainable development index, which also Hickel refers to, and where Costa Rica is actually comes out as the best country to live in, where they have solid public services and not uh, compared to the GDP that they, they produce. Costa Rica. Costa Rica, yeah, in the middle of your figure. So that's interesting. So, and he's arguing all the time for the public services to be as a kind of the premise for, for, for good societal development, rather than expecting that growth in itself is going to trickle down in some way. And in some way. Hmm. Yeah, adaptation, of course, uh, we have to, uh, I didn't mention it too much, you're right. Um, I think it's really key, uh, I mean, the, the theme of today's uh, seminar is health equity, uh, and it comes really um, immediately. It's, as soon as you touch uh, adaptation, it becomes uh, immediately um, crucial because um, you hear several interventions about adaptation can be very, very uh, unequal. Um, think of, um, I don't know, um, conditioning uh, homes and, and, and living spaces that pushes out uh, more uh, um, hot uh, air. And the, the urban heat island is an example, I mean, it's a result of uh, increased conditioning. So, um, yeah, indeed, it's, uh, unfortunately, climate crisis is real and we, we must adapt. We are adapting in many ways, of course. Uh, nowadays, we don't have, the, for example, the, the huge uh, unexpected uh, um, peaks of mortality like we had in 2003, was it? First uh, sort of big heat wave wave uh, in Europe, uh, but, the, but the impact remains uh, very large and going to increase, unfortunately, and, and you can see it at the global scale, these massive um, uh, disasters happening in, in vulnerable uh, areas of the world, but also locally, so yeah, um, adaptation is really an area where you have to put equity on top of the list. Thank you. Thank you to our three speakers. Um, do we have any further questions in the audience or perhaps online? Ah, we, we have a question here. Thank you very much for all four excellent interventions. You made me wondering, because uh, we started preparing our fourth equity report for Slovenia just a month ago, and then we were discussing which topics to put into it. And we came to 
environment and health as something what we haven't been elaborating very well still. Um, so we started uh, exploring which topics to put and which data do we have and from which sectors do we get data. So thank you so much for <laughs> reminding me of the energy. But I'm just wondering, what do you think, what would be your proposals to present in the country? What are the equity, what are the really equity dimensions uh, in any society? What, where, which direction to go? Which elements to bring in? Because we have been looking into the air pollution and noise and the different, um, different uh, determinants from that angle. I'm just wondering what would be your view if you have a country and you are preparing equity report in that area. I know that Vaughan is working on that as, uh, as such, but just so what would be your tips? Thank you. Thank you. Can I invite okay. us? Thank you. That is a major question, but I'm glad you, you acknowledge that energy is somehow key both to adaptation and mitigation. I think you know it's so vital for everything we do, both as a public service or privately. But uh, I, I get reminded of when we did a study on the eco villages in Norway. We assumed that people would choose those for you know environmental reasons, and they were sharing, and they were you know organic farming and so on. But when we interviewed them and when they expressed how it was to live there, they did not even barely mention those environmental aspects. But the main thing was the social uh, community. So to be so rewarded, living together with people in, you know, getting, that's the kind of community that you really want in a way in any neighborhood, but they were supportive and there were wine clubs and all kinds of fun things. Uh, but they were also, so it was more like a tick off an extra bonus that this was also sustainable. So, so to me also working more qualitatively than, you know, count, counting pollution or whatever, uh, it's, it can, you know, somehow get that kind of qualitative uh, approach to what is a good way of living. How do people live good lives and communities, how can we organize them to be, become good? If that could be a part of any kind of report, I would be thrilled to see it. <laughs> mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Art. Of course. Yes, I was thinking specifically two tips, uh, uh, Moitza. One is um, uh, agriculture, as I mentioned. It's funny because Slovenia, we were there 20 years ago talking of, uh, it was one of the few examples where we, we considered agriculture, but if you, in this light now, uh, you know, the environmental implications, uh, how they, they, they mingle with nutrition and alcohol consumption. Um, and you want to, you, you, probably these days you want to take a, a broader look, not su supranational, because uh, you know you can import the import export. We heard today mentioned the commercial determinants of health. I think it's really relevant. So that's number one. Number two, um, uh, and that reflects a lot of experience we did over the years, is um, looking at the issue of um, big um, sites of industrial development. They tend to be. Uh, we worked uh, in European projects uh, for many years. These hotspots uh, areas um, are, um, they, they combine high levels of exposure to all sorts of uh, environmental contaminants, mixing with uh, uh, social deprivation typically. Uh, so you have all the, 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 the lifestyle uh, factors coming in with uh, very obvious uh, synergistic effects. And they require, and, and it's a very heavy um, source of uh, health inequality, uh, operating very often a very small scale, but not always so. Um, and uh, yeah, I would certainly consider that. Thank you. I believe we have one question on the floor, so we'll just wait for our microphone. Thank you. Thank you, Harris Hamslico, with Cultural European Dentist again. Um, first of all, thank you very much for bringing these specialists together. It's really, you know, fall into place as a lot of things. Um, uh, you mentioned Almata, if I, and also early today, Otto was mentioned. And in my view, in my sort of mind, primary prevention of disease is done by the health sector. If you go to the Ottawa Charter of, of uh, promotion, we go beyond the health sector, we go to different sectors. And I think maybe that uh, could maybe have a comment on that one. And, and the reason I'm also mentioning that is that we are now working in my field in dentistry on what can we do, you know, and prevention, prevention, prevention or, or, or promotion is really, really important. 
And to put it both together, I was representing World Dental Federation in a Minamata conference, in a COP on Minamata. And this is the, this is the UNEP uh, conference on, on mercury. And of course, in Almalga, there is mercury. And uh, there is a big you know, discussion in, in the dental dentist sector. Um, you know, what to do. There are many, many countries in Norway, Sweden and Denmark. Uh, amalgam has been forbidden for many, many years. But in, many, in most other countries, they're still using amalgam, although reducing, however. And I think, you know, the, the UNEP and the health and environment, uh, I think that it's really, for me, it's the crucial, crucial thing. And just to end, it's for, uh, one of the things actually we, I didn't think about is that the, it's, called, it's nitro oxide gas. It's a laughter gas we are doing for children. And if it's a leakage, it goes just direct into the atmosphere. So thank you. Thank you. And perfectly timed, because we had time for just one last question, so that's perfect. Can I just ask if any of our panel members would like to come in? So, Remco, I think this might be... Thank you. Because I referred to the Almaty Declaration, and indeed, it, to bring that together, the, the comprehensive primary health care and the Ottawa Charter on Health Promotion, I think th this community is, has learned to work with it. But if I li listen to my students, then in their early 20s, and they, they, it, doesn't, it doesn't resonate anymore. It's not appearing anymore also in, uh, in, many, in many education. Because there is so much push for, let's say, the more technical, protocolized, individualist solutions. So I think education really has a role there to bring a newer generation into these concepts which are very it's not that we reinvent it's not that we have to re make a new innovation or thinking about how to deal with these problems it's incredible how 50 years ago 1986. Uh, huh? 1986. yeah with the help but also before or with the, with the limits to growth report with uh, all what is being being done there so there's a there's a lot of good directions but we need to translate them to the 21st century uh, and realize indeed that there is a there's a big uh, pull to get into the individualist digital more targeted solutions and we need to um, also contextualize that then in, in practice and in trainings uh, etc thank you thank you i'm afraid we do we we have run out of time for our for our conversation, but can I ask the audience to please thank our speakers? Okay. So I would like to hand over to Caroline Costungs, who's the director of EuroHealthNet, and who will be talking to us with a few final conclusions. Thank you. So. What a seminar that was with the great inspiring speakers and fantastic to see you all here and also to all of our online participants. I've learned a lot and uh, just Martin told me of one of the issues. Oh, this is a new thought. I hadn't thought about this. Mm -hmm. And this is what it is about, no? That you gather new thoughts that you haven't thought of before and that you mingle that into your own work. Um, so the topics today that we discuss, the challenges of health inequalities and climate change uh, and the NCDs, uh, it seems very far away and, you know, very complex, is very complex, but they're also very much interrelated. And I would like to highlight three uh, commonalities across these uh, topics. Uh, the first of all, uh, as we have heard by Remco and others, there is a common root problem uh, for these topics, and that is the fact that our current economy is indeed not uh, designed for health, equity and well-being. It's very much driving production and driving overconsumption, and it doesn't really care about nature or about health or about inequality, uh, but it wants short-term profit and GDP growth. And, and that is something that, uh, that we need to work on to see, can, are we able to create an economy that is of quality and is sustainable um, and can serve people and the planet at the same time. And this is part of the thinking of the economy of well-being and the work also that, uh, that Remco was uh, presenting to us. 
So this means that we have to fundamentally change the way how politicians and policymakers and the industry is thinking about the economy, and that is of course not easy. But here I think targets would work, because target setting was also one of the objectives of this seminar, and we may uh, need as a pu public health community to work more on targets that are linked to the economy. I liked uh, what you were saying uh, of this target of not uh, banning advertisement on unhealthy food and products for children up to 18 years old. That's a good target. There are other targets, like we should have free public transport, or we should uh, uh, not tax uh, fruit and vegetables. Or in the European Commission, uh, they have set a directive now on, uh, on wages and on uh, minimum income measures, and that should become a standard in all member states. So at the uh, EuHealthNet, we have been looking at the European semester, and you may not know of the European semester, which I can't blame you because it's not something that you normally hear about. But the European semester is an economic tool of the European Commission, a macroeconomic tool. And we, uh, every year with the EU HealthNet Partnership, we are checking to what extent the European semester is able to contribute to health equity. And we had an event in the parliament where we looked at how such European tool uh, that, that shapes in a way or that helps steer economies, how that can be used to move towards the economy of well-being. And I think that is an important role of us to be part of those uh, discussions at the EU level. Another, uh, a second issue I think what is uh, 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 common to all three challenges of equity in NCDs and the climate crisis is that they are best dealt with uh, upstream and with prevention rather than indeed repairing the problems uh, or fixing uh, the, all of the damages which is in a way much more costly. And for climate, this means that all public policies, they should adhere to a principle of do not harm to nature. Ideally, also restoring nature and restoring biodiversity, but already the principle do not harm to nature is vital. For health equity and for NCDs, what we want, and I think we should use more of health equity impact assessments as a tool and to make that more part uh, of governing, uh, government, uh, governance. Um, uh, the same uh, in, in terms of targets, we should define targets, I think, for boosting prevention and promotion. We all know the, the famous figure of uh, that currently about 2 to 3% of national healthcare budgets goes to prevention. We can say you want a target of 6%, because in Canada they actually already uh, spend 6% of their healthcare budgets on prevention. But we can also be more ambitious and say, well, we want prevention to be core of health systems and we want to move from curative cur and curing health systems to more caring and from health promoting health systems. Um, because we know that health systems are unsustainable, they are struggling. It's in the news uh, often that the health workforce uh, they are uh, struggling with the NCDs, with the aging, uh, now with the climate issues there. Uh, so we need to fundamentally rethink our health systems and put prevention um, and promotion core. So that means in terms of targets, we need to move away from 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 number of beds, or not move away, but in addition to number of beds and doctors, we need to be stronger in, okay, what kind of targets do we want to set in terms of the diseases that we prevent uh, or uh, the health that we uh, promote. A third uh, commonality um, uh, for climate crisis and NCDs, and that's something that we haven't really discussed yet in this seminar, is that um, it's very much linked to the behavior of people. And people need to change their behavior. Uh, we need to people out of the car, uh, active travel, they need to eat more plant-based, less meat. I saw the figures, uh, I don't know who showed it, you know, the, the impact of, of meat on, on our climate and environment is huge. Uh, we want them to recycle more, uh, and less taking the plane, all sorts of things that in principle people really do not like, you know, <laughs> because it, it, it addresses your, your comfort zone and your way of living. And we know from Susan, Mickey and others that if you want to change behaviours of people, they need to have the opportunity to change, the capability to change and the motivation to change. 
And, um, and we know that if we talk about health equity, this is an issue because many people do not have the opportunity or the capability. And the people more at the, the lower end of the social gradient, they often stuck in their day-to-day -day situations in the, their deprived communities and you know, they do not have the choice uh, to, or the luxury to choose uh, to, to change the ways they, uh, they, they live. And that's why we see also lots of frustrations and people that are angry because the measures that they see coming from the climate discussions and the NCD discussions is that they, they cannot meet them or they feel like, uh, left behind. So therefore, and was also suggested by one of the speakers, we need to <clears throat> see how we as governments and authorities uh, open up the dialogue with the people. So we need to to get more uh, um, uh, channels and, and ways of, of communicating with citizens and to make sure that all the voices are being heard and particularly the voices of those that would uh, suffer or that would not would be really difficult for them to adhere to the measures uh, uh, that, that will be coming up. Uh, so maybe we need to set some, some targets around participation. You heard about the citizens' councils, the citizen health councils. And, and what is a target of participation? How many people? 10, you know, 10 percent, <laughs> thousands. Uh, I think as a public health community, we need, to, we need to think what we want to achieve here. Anyway, um, you heard from the very start that the, we have now a window of opportunity. Uh, there will be the European elections uh, uh, for the new European Parliament, a new commission uh, taking place uh, next year. Um, there's also the SDGs that are going to be reviewed. So it would be good for us to select, okay, what targets, what do we want to put forward uh, and be smart in that because the problem of the system approach is that it is so much you know, and, and, and we need action on so, so many areas. So we need to find a way how we can decide, okay, which, which ones do we want to put forward and which ones can we, can we uh, see uh, effects on the short term, long term. And uh, I'm happy that we are here with the Euro Health Net uh, partnership and we will, we will be meeting uh, the next two days. And this seminar also was a bit of a kickstart for, for our thinking process um, because we will uh, work on an, an advocacy statement for this the, the coming year where we hope to decide and to see you know, which sort of targets and, and what capacities would we need in order to address all of these challenges that we, that we heard. And uh, we were also making use of uh, a foresight uh, exercise uh, together with the Danish um, Institute for Future Studies. So, um, yes, yeah, so and therefore this uh, seminar for us was uh, really very important. And uh, I would like to thank all of the speakers to give such wonderful uh, insights in, uh, for, for our work. Um, yes, so before I hand over to, uh, to our hosts, I would again indeed like to thank the speakers already and on behalf of your health state and also Moit and Samina for uh, moderating it so well and also to, uh, to David and the Euro Health Net team because they have been really working hard to uh, make sure that you're all here and that our people online uh, uh, following this, uh, this seminar. So thanks a lot and I would like to introduce now our host, uh, this Oivin Jeva Gaver. He's a director of the Department of Social Determinants here at the Directorate. So, Eugen, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. And, and I'd like to join you in, in all your thanks to all the interesting talks uh, today. And also uh, to you, Caroline, for, as always, very uh, good reflections uh, now. Uh, Representing uh, the host and the local community here in Oslo, I'd like just briefly to uh, try to relate some of the very major issues we've been discussing today to uh, the here and now. Um, of course, we are uh, very happy to uh, introduce you to an Oslo with 20 degrees and the and, uh, sun. Uh, and you know, light from uh, early morning to, to late night and, uh, and all that. But uh, unfortunately, I must say, this is quite out of the normal uh, range of weather in, in Oslo. Now we have several weeks of 
it, it's beginning to look like a drought actually, uh, because June is normally a very wet uh, month in Oslo. Uh, so uh, climate change is, is very much here and now, and it's felt, uh, I think we all feel these changes um, uh, in our everyday life. So that's climate change. Uh, also, I'd like to point out uh, it's probably not very well known, but Oslo is uh, actually one of the more uh, divided cities in the world, in, in Europe at least, uh, when it comes to social inequalities and in health. Uh, we saw the, the Washington Red Line uh, uh, life expectancy uh, differences earlier today. Uh, I think we can almost match match it uh, here in Oslo, actually, and that's uh, because Oslo is a very traditional, you know, industrial east and west uh, divided city, and the the determinants, the NCDs, uh, the causes, the immediate causes of these uh, social inequalities have very much changed over time. So that tells me uh, and reinforces really uh, the uh, the message from several of the. Uh, speakers today that there is something about the, the very uh, basic social determinants uh, that should be addressed. So uh, in both these issues, climate change and, and NCDs and social inequalities, um, I think we all feel that uh, although uh, they are part of our everyday life now, they have to uh, be solved and discussed and, and addressed more globally. So I was uh, reminded of the, uh, if, if any of you can remember, the Agenda 21 slogan, uh, act locally, uh, think globally. It's, we're almost at a place now, I believe, that we can turn it around. We, uh, the issues that we, we feel and contemplate in our uh, local, everyday uh, life has to be uh, solved and addressed uh, globally, and what better uh, opportunity to uh, to do that, or at least to to take some steps uh, to do this than than this kind of international um, uh, seminars and, and um, uh, that that Euro Health Net is and, and, and other uh, seminars like it. So uh, we're very happy here in the Directorate of Health to hold this kind of. Um, uh, seminar and, and the meeting for the next couple of days. And with that, uh, I'll uh, just uh, wrap it up and uh, say that you are all welcome for non-alcoholic drinks and snacks in the open space uh, right uh, behind us uh, outside the doors here. And uh, thank you very much for a very good seminar. <laughs>